A New England town, Litchfield, Connecticut. Pleasant, quiet, old, going back well before the revolution. Houses that knew the revolution, that heard within their walls new thoughts and ideas. Strange, passionate thoughts, stirring ideas, liberty, freedom from oppression, equality. They gave birth to the revolution, and years later they bred another conflict, the Civil War. This is the Beecher House, what's left standing of it now. Henry Ward Beecher, Harriet Beecher Stowe. A plaque to their memory stands under ancient trees in the village square. Harriet Beecher Stowe. There's more to her memory than a plaque. Hers is a living memory. The story she wrote a century ago, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uncle Tom's Cabin excited the nation. Its vivid indictment of oppression raised the old battle cries of freedom and equality. What is written here stirred a nation's conscience. These words were glowing embers that burst into flame in the war between the states. That long, bloody conflict between the idea of freedom and the idea of slavery. A wonderful story. Next to the Bible, the most widely read story in the world. Millions have read it over the century. Many, many millions. Who doesn't know about Uncle Tom and Eliza, Topsy and Eva, and that most villainous of all villains, Simon Legree? We may smile now at some of what we're going to see, at the utter badness of Simon, at the utter goodness of Eva, so good we may even see her halo. For after all, this story was put on film in the old silent days. The styles were different then. Acting was more emphatic. There were different ideas about cameras and lights and those old notions about comedy. Yet through it all, the drama surges vivid and turbulent. And the glowing, vibrant story illuminates the spirit of those days. Now let us go back in time. A century in time, another day, another condition of life. That life told to us in Uncle Tom's Cabin. Our story begins some years before the Civil War at the home of the Shelbys, a gracious plantation in the southern border state of Kentucky. In those days, each day was much like another, full of pleasant pursuits and of gaiety and good living. There were many visitors, much courtesy, and everyone liked the Shelbys. Mrs. Shelby herself was a gentlewoman generous to her slaves and devoted to her husband. Shelby had one fault, he borrowed. Mostly from Haley, an uncouth man whose company Shelby felt forced to endure in return for his cash. The Shelby slaves had a somewhat different condition of life from that which went on in the big house. It is often said of the Negro that he is always happy-go-lucky. He thinks only of the present, never of the future. Which is quite understandable, for neither present nor future are his to decide. Who would not live for the moment and try to be happy in it, knowing himself to be only a piece of property that, like a dog or a stick of furniture, can be bought or sold as its master chose? Eliza was, to the casual eye, as white as any at the big house, yet a slave nevertheless. Her heritage was mixed. In the odd arithmetic of slavery, one drop of Negro blood outweighed all else and kept Eliza bound instead of free. 
Yes, however diverse in outward appearance, they were the same, equal only in their bondage. Eliza did not live in the poor cabins that housed the rest of the slaves. She was Mrs. Shelby's personal body servant. She lived in a room of her own in the mansion. The Shelbys dressed Eliza well, as befits a body servant. But this was a very special dress, one of Mrs. Shelby's own. She had insisted that Eliza wear it. For like the dress, this was a very special day. Eliza was deeply grateful to her owners. For Mr. Shelby had granted a great boon, permission to marry, just like white folks. Today was Eliza's wedding day. A great event. The cotton was left standing in the fields. Everyone answered the summons. A real wedding with a real preacher. The bridegroom, George Harris. Of mixed blood, like Eliza, George was a slave rented out to the Shelbys by a neighbor, one Edward Harris, a cotton planter like Shelby. They made, as the saying goes, a fine couple. On the evening of the wedding, Uncle Tom, returning from a trip across the river to Ohio, where his master had sent him to fetch certain monies that Shelby owed to Haley. For three generations, Uncle Tom and his ancestors had been faithful servitors to the Shelby family. Haley could scarce credit his eyes. A slave sent into a free state like Ohio, money in his pocket, and not even trying to escape. Not Uncle Tom. He was proud of his master's trust. He took great pride in being obedient and faithful. With his wife, his children, his cozy cabin, a contented man was Uncle Tom. Or perhaps it would be remiss to call him a man, a slave, rather, a contented slave. Not for him the doubts and fears of other slaves. They might live in dread, fearing each day that their families might be separated, sold, traded from one master to another, never to see one another again. Such could never happen to Uncle Tom, never. When marriage vows are made, it is human nature to make other promises as well. Content with each other, they were, unlike Uncle Tom, far from content with their lot. Their plans were of freedom. George would earn freedom for both of them. So they planned and dreamed of the future, while the entire plantation celebrated. These poor unfortunates who had no future and took their happiness in each passing moment.
In less extreme fashion, their masters also celebrated. George Harris is master. His arrival cast a pall on the celebration. He had come for his slave. Wedding night or not, he would have him. No ghost at any feast created greater consternation. Their dreams of the future came shattering down into the present. demanded Harris, getting married without my consent. When George tried to protest, he was taught that a slave has no more right to protest than to marry. In vain, Mrs. Shelby pleaded, and Shelby even offered to buy George. But Harris was adamant. George was not for sale. of furniture, a dog, beaten, driven away, while Eliza mourned and all mourned with her. Now six years have passed. It is winter now, cold, hard winter. Shelby is deeper in debt than ever, his funds exhausted. Haley insists on immediate payment, if not in cash, then in slaves. First on Haley's list is Uncle Tom. Shelby cannot part with him. Uncle Tom is like one of the family. But he doesn't have the money. While the years have brought trouble to her master, to Eliza they have brought a son. A sturdy youngster wearing the curls and pantaloons so fashionable for children these days. Harry, son of Eliza, and of the husband torn from Eliza's arms, George Harris. Eliza knows, as she is known from the moment his face appeared at the window. George is running away from his master.
Why? What has he done now? George tells her. Harris is forcing him to marry one of his slaves this very evening. There is one path of escape, north, into a free state, and then to Canada. Only in Canada can a man be free from slavery. Once there, George will earn freedom for Eliza and their child. In the drawing room, the business affairs of a gentleman in debt are put aside for the moment. eager to drive a good hard bargain, cannot help but wonder. Shelby owes him a great deal of money. Uncle Tom is not enough to cover it. Such a bright young lad, talented as well. Haley presses his advantage. Shelby must realize Tom alone ain't enough. One thing Haley would hate to do is foreclose. Got such a high regard for Shelby's wife. He would hate to, but... Now, if Shelby will throw in the boy as well... At last, Shelby has no choice. Tom and Harry are Haley's. Nothing, Eliza. Nothing. Only that you have come for your baby. Say, sir, be polite and servile. Bedtime. That's why you have come for him. It is his bedtime. Not bedtime, no bed, no sleep for either. Now Eliza must flee to save the child she loves. It is warm in Uncle Tom's cabin, cozy, secure. They have so much to be thankful for. The Lord has been good to them. And not only the Lord, their good master, Mr. Shelby, also. Eliza's news falls like a bombshell upon the family. Not only has their good master sold Harry, but Uncle Tom as well. Eliza will try to get to the river and cross over. Tom must go with her.
Not Uncle Tom. He thinks of his master's trouble, not his own. Whatever comes, Uncle Tom accepts as the will of the Lord. Go, Eliza, and God bless you. There is no sign of George, only the cold wind, yet not as cold as the thought of capture. Only the fearful deep snow, yet not as deep as the fear of within. Heavy, heavy, the drawn breath gasping, the sharp pain of tortured lungs, Legs aching, aching, stumbling, falling. An inn close by the river. Eliza must rest. She can go no further. Two gentlemen are present as Eliza enters. Her agitated state intrigues them. The storm caught them while returning from a neighbor. The kindly landlady is all solicitude, clucking with sympathy. A warm room, a warm fire. Away from the public room, and the gaze of those two outside. If Eliza but knew. Marx and Loka are slave traders. Already they suspect. At Shelby Hall, another arrives on the trail of a runaway, Edward Harris, in search of his slave, George. He discovers that Eliza and Harry are also missing. Harris and Haley set out to recover their property. Harris has brought his bloodhounds. Mrs. Shelby, certain that all three have fled together. can speak aloud. Pray that they escape. The bloodhounds are sharp of nose, keen for the scent they must track down. The snow has drifted. The scent grows faint. It is lost. It's certain none could cross the river this night. They'll warm up at the inn. are looking for their property. A small boy, a light-complected man. A 
hundred dollars reward for the boy? Not bad. And perhaps they can take the woman for themselves. The bargain made, Marx prepares to collect the reward. River, freedom on the far side, but far so far, impassable, fearful, yet stronger than any fear of cold, of ice, of rushing torrent is the love that binds her to her burden. Nothing is stronger than that. Eliza takes the desperate gamble. Rushing water, black and swirling, cold, cold, cold. On the opposite shore, one Phineas Fletcher, a kindly Quaker. Fletcher, a man of quick wit and surprising strength, regards slavery as an abomination. He must do what he can. Thus, from the close edge of death, rescued. Here, the Ohio bank, the freedom side of the river. Such a morning it is, so calm in the home of Eliza's benefactors. The storm, the desperate crossing on the ice, the ravening hounds, all as if they had never occurred. A nightmare. 
Eliza is as enchanted by Mrs. Flood's manner of speech as by her gentle care, her soft voice saying, Thee, thy child. The most wonderful of news. Thy husband has crossed the river also. He shall be here after dark to start for Canada with thee. Even in a free state, danger remains. Eliza is subject to the Dred Scott decision. A slave can be taken wherever found. There is no escape, this time no way out. Fortified by all the force of law, the future closes in on Eliza. Here too, a gentle morning. The snow, no longer seeming fierce, is a soft mantle on ground and trees. It has been this way so often. Poor Tom could close his eyes, yet see it so clear. Here was he born. Here spent all his days. The long, slow passing days of his youth. Here his marriage, his children. His home, his life, his all, his everything. From tree and branch, the melting snow glitters like tears. Pleasant voyage for many. Salubrious breezes, fine scenery, leisurely moving from landing to landing. On the lowermost deck, occasionally heard above the throbbing of the ship itself, another sound the rattle of chains. Mr. St. Clair, a gentleman of New Orleans. Recently widowed, Mr. Sinclair is taking his cousin Ophelia to run his estate. Ophelia is from Vermont. The crude, boisterous manners of such as Haley distress her greatly. Continually since Marx and Loka seized his wife and child, George Harris has haunted the river boats. His search is never ending the risk of his own capture present always. George Harris, the runaway. And Haley must, of course, send George back to his master. No need for haste about it. George cannot escape. Eva Sinclair, little Eva a sickly child, so good and compassionate, her every thought is of others. To most of these, little Eva is a ray of sunshine brightening up their dark despair.
toy, such as Uncle Tom made often for his own children. She is touched by his sadness. If only there was some way she could help. To many on shore, the approach of a riverboat is a fine sight, but to these, never. Eliza is grateful only that she and Harry are still together. She will never give him up. There will be no problem. Stolen goods, but once on board, who can tell? The tangled thread of lives so close, so desperate. His only thought, escape. To avoid being sent back to his owner. Escape. he seeks move from land to shipboard unnoticed. is disturbed. If only there was something she could do. Perhaps her father would buy Uncle Tom. Would he like that? Eliza and Harry are told to lie low. Haley is on board. Your boy belongs to him. If you want to keep him, stay out of sight. The tangled thread. A ship leaves the shore. A wife and child, unknowing, leave the one who yearns for sight of them. The bargain for Uncle Tom is struck quickly. In midstream, his life changes course. In place of an uncharted future, a new kind master, a young mistress who is the most tender-hearted of all creatures. While mother and child rest, another bargain is being made. 
planter named Proctor. Proctor wants the boy. He'll make a fine slave. A good, sturdy slave. Strong, healthy. Shall we say $300? Signed and sealed. Ah, but delivered, that's a different matter. It must be soon. Proctor gets off at the next landing. Eliza sleeps. Exhausted, she sleeps. Even in slumber, certain her child is with her.
gone, gone. The ground is soft, the air so sweet, gone. The battle begun at Fort Sumter spreads, bursts into war, a nation divided. At the St. Clair's, little Eva's health concerns them more. The war seems far away. Tom, tending his ailing young mistress, reads to her of the great event. All persons held as slaves shall be thenceforward and forever free. Thenceforward and forever free. Perhaps soon Tom will be reunited with his family. Tom's heart is full of thanks and full of alarm. Little Missy is not well, not well. A constant source of irritation in the St. Clair household is Topsy. Topsy is an imp getting into everything, disobedient, unruly, as mischievous as a jackdaw. Ophelia has to follow Topsy like a hawk. Always a ready explanation. Topsy didn't mean to do anything wrong. She only wanted to see what it was like to be white instead of black. Like Missy Eva. Aunt Ophelia has the strongest sentiments against slavery. But like so many northerners, she has an aversion to Negroes. Their skin is so dark, so strange. Ophelia knows she is wrong, and she makes every effort to overcome her prejudice. Topsy delights in baiting her. She knows she mustn't pick flowers, but they're for little Eva. Certainly, Aunt Ophelia can't punish her for that.
Topsy is very surprised. She can't imagine how it got up her sleeve. they came from. She did take the gloves, but the ribbon never saw it before. Topsy, always helpful, suggests a whipping. For once, her suggestion is accepted. think of it, maybe she did take that ribbon. Or was it the other way around? A liar, a thief. What is it that makes Topsy so bad? If she would only try to be good, in Topsy's untutored mind, the reason is clear. Only white is good. To be black is to be bad, wicked. Who could love a worthless slave? Little Eva loves her. Now, for the first time, she drops all pretense. The lonely child, whose only defense against the world that looked down on her, need pretend defiance no longer. And when Little Eva says, please try to be good, I won't be with you for long. Topsy pleads for her to stay, to get well. Her heart, once empty of love, cannot bear the thought. is empty again. Many hearts are empty. Eva, little Eva. 
The spark of life flickers and fades. The soul departs. a bed, so small a child, little Eva. Funeral bed that night, Topsy brings a tribute. So pretty a flower, so red against the pale, pale hands. Eva had loved her. Now there is no one to love Topsy, no one. Ophelia will love her. She opens her crusty heart. Her arms are a haven for Topsy. Augustine Sinclair did not long survive little Eva. His entire estate is put up for sale. Except for Topsy, taken back to Vermont by Aunt Ophelia, every slave is put on the auction block. Uncle Tom, his dreams of rejoining his family shattered, is bid for by Simon Legree, a planter notoriously cruel to his slaves. Bid and sold to Simon Legree. Many slaves come to this place, among them Eliza, Eliza is alone now, her spirit broken since the day Harry was taken from her. Slaves of mixed blood, such as Eliza, are sought after, highly regarded. 
The bidding is sharp. A thousand, eleven hundred, twelve, fifteen hundred dollars. to Simon Legree. Uncle Tom and Eliza. Now they have a master much different from the one they had served in happier times. Across two states, through town after town, George Harris continues his search. He has learned who bought his son. Is there a planter named Proctor living in this town? Everywhere, the same question. Simon Legree's plantation, like its master, is grim and foreboding. Many slaves have died here, beaten, starved, tortured. For Eliza, Simon has other plans. Her he will make his mistress, assuring her not to be afraid. He wouldn't hurt her. Simon would never hurt anything. For 20 years enslaved to Simon Legree, her life saddened by Simon's brutality. And by memories of the baby torn from her breast long ago. Until the arrival of Eliza, Cassie had been mistress here. Simon accuses Cassie of jealousy. It is not jealousy. Cassie's hatred is deep and fierce. Simon is often threatened to send her back to the slave quarters where she belongs. But she defies him. No one will take her place in this household. Cassie, alone of all his slaves, stands up to him, daring Simon, taunting him, saying it is he who is afraid, not she. Uncle Tom has been causing trouble. He has been preaching to the slaves, holding prayer meetings when they should be picking cotton. I do all the praying around here. Never in all his life has Tom hurt another human being. Do it. You belong to me, body and soul. No, master. My body may belong to you, but my soul belongs to God. 
The wrath intended for Cassie turns on Uncle Tom. Whip him. The hardest he ever had. Over the countryside. On roads choked with dust. On foot, on horse, the Union troops. The columns march on town after town. The news of their approach sends many into flight. In one such town, George Harris's long search goes on. So many towns. So many people named Proctor. Forget the heat. The burden is gone. The heavy weight of slavery lifted. Only 10 miles from the advancing Union troops, Simon enjoys what promises to be a pleasant evening. In the slave quarters, nursing Uncle Tom. Cassie pours out her story, the grief now 20 years old. She had been brought up a lady, a white lady, until her mixed heritage was revealed. Then her baby had been sold. Cassie brought here down river while her baby had been sold to a man named Shelby. Eliza, she can hardly believe it. Eliza is her daughter. Cassie must be careful. Simon must not learn the truth. She must save her daughter without arousing the slightest suspicion. She pretends jealousy accusing Eliza of trying to steal her man. frantic and fearful, cannot at once understand. Over and over the words are repeated. I'm your mother, your mother. 
whispered words that do not carry beyond the locked door. Eliza, I'm your mother. Cassie, who had never feared for herself, now fears for her daughter. thinks the ghosts of all those he murdered dwell there. They will be safe in the attic. Where are they? Where are they gone? Tom will not say. Beaten, sorely hurt, his concern is still for others. they can take. All roads are the same so long as they lead south. It is late. A storm is near. Will they call a halt, make camp for the night? The troops march on, ever closer to the Legree plantation. Simon orders his overseers to fetch Uncle Tom. Despite the last beating, he has not yet revealed the hiding place of Cassie and Eliza. Superstition. Despite his brute strength, Simon Legree dreads all signs and manifestations of the spirit world. Fear of the unknown, terror of the world beyond. Still he forces himself forward, his desire struggling against his fright. Wind howls like a soul in torment, whirling down the stairwell in a great gust. In it, Simon imagines the moans and cries of all his victims. They seem all around him, plucking at his sleeve, whispering crying. They are with him, in the room, in the air. In his mind, he sees a ghostly congregation crowded above him, oppressive and imminent. With savage relief, he turns all his fury on poor Tom. Where are they? Simon has made up his mind. 
He's going to kill Tom, unless he admits where the women are. And he tells him so. Eliza's first thought is of Tom, but Cassie knows it is useless. How far now from Legree? In the rising wind, the branches crack like whips. The toll exacted from the poor slave is too much even for the brutal overseer. Tom is dying. A gentle man. All his life spent humbly, his precepts those of the good book. Too gentle for a world inhabited by such as Simon Legree. His goodness, his gentle soul, touch all who know him. Tom forgives them, as he himself would wish to be forgiven. His drink-crazed mind conjures up a vision. that beckons him on. He cannot face it alone. He is in the attic. Drive him out. is not that of a spirit. It is real. And the ghosts, real also.
column passes, they decide to ask for help. Uncle Tom is dead, gone to his reward, as Simon Legree has gone to his. And pray that slavery is dead as well, that for those living, all persons held as slaves shall be thenceforward and forever free. Forever free.